Hello, you're listening to Sending the Experts with Georgina Durrant. This podcast is all about teaching and supporting children and young people with special educational needs and disabilities, SEND. My name is Georgina Durrant. I'm the host of this podcast brought to you by Twinkle SEND. As a former teacher in Senko myself, I wanted to create a platform to share some of the amazing things that my guests are doing to support learners with SEND. So whether you're listening on your commute, tuning in whilst walking your dog or curled up on the sofa with a nice cup of coffee, thank you so much for joining us. In this episode, I will be speaking with three guests about the Dyslexia Screening Bill, which proposes that all children are screened for dyslexia by the end of primary school. My guests are trustee of the BDA, Dr. Helen Ross, Conservative MP, Matt Hancock, and Labour MP, Sharon Hodgson. Up first is Dr. Helen Ross. She is a qualified special needs teacher and former SENCO, working as an independent educational research consultant, specialist assessor, and SEND expert. Helen is a trustee of the British Dyslexia Association and is chair of the Wiltshire Dyslexia Association. She has consulted for the British Dyslexia Association, the Committee for Science and Technology and Wiltshire Local Authority. She also works with various third sector and commercial organisations with evaluation, consultancy and resource development. And you can find her on Twitter. She tweets at Dr Helen Ross and regularly speaks on dyslexia and special educational needs. Hi, Helen. How are you? I'm all right. How are you? I'm very good good thank you so this podcast episode is all about dyslexia and the new dyslexia screening bill can you first explain to our listeners what dyslexia actually is the kind of like formal definition that we generally work to at the minute Mm -hmm. is actually the BDA one so the British Dyslexia Association one um I certainly do when I do assessments and stuff and it's sort of operationalized so that it's a diagnostic model so it's Mm -hmm. where you an individual has wobbles with their kind of phonological awareness so that's like chunking down sounds and stuff and missing bits off words adding bits to words blending and things like that and that a lot of kids in primary school in their early years do that anyway as part of their phonics work yeah and it also implicates verbal memory so hearing stuff like hearing words hearing sentences instructions lists of stuff stuff tends to go in one ear and out the other um yeah and also verbal processing so a lot of time that's about finding words it's it, it's that feeling of i know the word but it's kicking about somewhere in the back of my mind and I can't say it and that tend so that's kind of a a a clinical what for want of a better word a clinical definition but pragmatically in the classroom it can look like kids struggle to read they can't blend Mm -hmm. their words they're learning to read they can't link like sounds of letters to what a letter looks like they can't necessarily link the letter name I had a kid the other day who just couldn't do any of that and it was it was really such a bright kid and it's so hard to see yeah um and it, it can look like wobbly right literally wobbly writing where it's okay. not very neat or spelling mistakes um it can also look like inattention like yeah if you've got a kid who's able to sort of find workarounds but not always or not quite it looks mm-hmm. like they're not bothered yeah so, um one of the phrases i hear quite a lot is a spiky profile can you explain what that yeah, is yeah spiky it, it sort of looks looks like a ski slope um <laughs> People either, when they do dyslexia assessments, they'll often put a bar chart in or like a line graph with the different yeah. scores. And it looks like you're doing, yeah, you're doing a kind of ski slope because some bits of somebody's profile would be really strong. Mm-hmm. So quite often you might get a kid who's very good verbally. If, if they're sort of classic dyslexic, they're good verbally, they're good visually. Um, mm-hmm. But then when it comes to phonological awareness, memory profile, they're, they're, they're low. So you've got yeah. this the gap between... And it's called a specific learning difficulty because there's specific gaps. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. No, that does make sense. So a child sitting in somebody listening's got a class and they've got a child in their class who might be sort of verbally able to answer the question seems quite bright yeah. in that sense. But then when they're doing the written work or the reading, really struggling exactly with that, that, that might be a bit of a Absolutely. red flag. It's that difference between what somebody can say and what they can write. Not always, but quite often. Yeah, that makes sense. So you're hugely passionate about SCND and specifically dyslexia. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your experience, like professionally and personally? You're dyslexic, I believe. Oh, when were you diagnosed? Um, What's your sort of oh, experience? <laughs> I'm book smart there's you know I, I have no common sense and when I open my mouth I kind of hide my <laughs> cleverness quite well um but actually <laughs> at school I work you know I got straight A's and A stars at GCSE I'm not a classic window achiever yeah. I'm not I'm I worked my yeah. backside off I'm very much a grafter but A level maths was it it was horrifically hard because I did mm-hmm. I did I was working towards doing engineering at uni um and I did mechanics which is kind of physics maths 
So like all Newtonian, yeah. no, Isaac Newton's kind of ideas applied to science. And then um, you have to read all the questions and they're quite wordy and they're quite technical. And I was like, but I can't understand. And honestly, uh, oh, it's horrible. Literally crying in class because I could not oh. get the maths. When my teacher, Mrs. McConaughey, might in school, 1999, ladies, awesome. <laughs> no, oh, shout out. No, seriously, <laughs> she's absolutely amazing. She and my mum, I don't know what they said about me, I dread to think, but my mum was doing work at Warwickshire College with adult literacy at the time. I grew up in Leamington Spa. And um, she, so she and Mrs. McConaughey like put their heads together and were like, yeah, she's she's a bit of a special bunny as Helen. Um, complicated. And they sent me over to like near Evesham um, to get assessed by mm-hmm. this lady. And um, yeah, I came out as dyslexic. So I've got like, I've, I I happened upon my report the other day because um, I was looking for a tax return. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I found the original document and I read it and I'm like, oh my God, it's me. Like that when I was 17, they yeah. picked up on like, proper good um, hands-on I'm very good hands-on but they also picked yeah. out that I'm quite anxious um because I am mm-hmm. yeah it's all over the internet I, mean, I don't hide the fact that I struggle with mental health and stuff there's no point hiding that yeah um no, and no, I think no. it's rooted in dyslexia um and not feeling enough mm-hmm. um so yeah I th- this report actually it was quite liberating um because I was like oh I'm not thick I was, I was, that yeah. was my thought with it and I think for me I ended up, I, I took a job in control systems engineering, which who knew wasn't necessarily good for me. Um, <laughs> anyone who, again, I open my mouth and you go, no, she's not going to be good at that. Um, oh. I taught in Barnsley then. And the kind of, the discourse coming out of central government around 2007, that was when I trained, um, was just, I mean, re- they had no idea. They had no idea, the DFE, what was going on in the ground. You've got a pit village where there's, just very little prospects um mm-hmm. a very complicated demographic situation really tricky families awesome kids I loved working in Barnsley I'm I'm so glad I did because I'd live in Barnsley over Bath any day um and it just kind of got me annoyed because they were expecting things socially and culturally that weren't in the sphere of where I was and I was just like we need to get kids mm-hmm. literacy before you fart around with Do anything before else. you mess around trying to yeah. Um, let's just get them reading, writing and doing a few sums and enjoying what they're reading, make it practical, yeah. useful. So then you can expand the horizon. So when you read consultations and that with government, they've all got PhDs. So I was like, I'm going to get yeah. me one of them. And I, I did hard graph. But Brilliant. so it kind of the, my personal journey, I didn't want kids to feel thick like I did. And the professional yeah. teachery journey kind of intersected with me having read consultations, sitting in a cafe in Cusco in Peru with with Andy, patient husband Andy, going, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do a PhD because I need to shout. And that that's kind of what led me to what I'm doing now. I'm very, very lucky. Andy is a patient, gracious man. <laughs> I love this. I love that you've done a shout out to your husband and to a teacher as well. That's brilliant. I, so that's that's where the passion came from then was you feeling not enough yeah, yeah, in school sure. and not wanting other people to feel that way Definitely, as well. Yeah. And that's presumably why you wanted to become a Senko and dyslexia assessor yeah. and tutor, etc. And what's your role at the moment then? <laughs> what are you what are you doing day to day? Because I know you were teaching previously, weren't you? That's been recently you've recently finished teaching, is that correct? Yes. Um <laughs> it's like one sentence. Um, I do assessments. <laughs> so I assess kids for dyslexia. I suppose I'm like a dyslexia expert and SEN consultant, if you want to be once. Yes. But that means like so day to day I assess kids. Um I do some cheering, so I'm not in the classroom anymore because I need to sleep and eat and I haven't got time to do everything thing um mm-hmm, that yeah makes sense. <laughs> how rude of me um but yeah so a lot of I'm working with a company at the minute evaluating some tech I've got a pro- just projects that I'm sort of jobbing researcher as well yeah so yeah lots of stuff around schooling education showing at the government uh, talking to the government I'm going to be speaking to Matt Hancock later in this episode about the dyslexia screening bill which I know you're well aware of but our list just for our listeners this bill has been put forward to ensure that all primary age children are screened for dyslexia by the time they leave primary school I believe what are your views on the bill do you welcome it Helen um I, I was in a podcast not a podcast like a thingy online a few weeks ago um with mm. Mr Hancock actually I think I might have watched this one where you, if anyone wants to have a look I think you got you got um quite passionate is that the one where you get quite passionate yeah, but about I had topic? numbers because I, I I had um because I did a systematic review um so the mm-hmm. office for science and technology I think it was um 
I can't, I'd have to double check. They commissioned me to do a review of yeah. provision and sort of summarise what the government did. So, uh, yeah, I had actual government figures <laughs> and numbers in front of me. Um, and I got a little, yeah, I'm a little bit grumpy. Um, I think the concept isn't bad. And I, I, I mm-hmm. Mr. Hancock kind of went, no, are you sure, Helen? I was like, okay, I'll, con- yeah. I think the idea of screening kids is fine. Um, screeners are yeah. insufficient for understanding your child completely um they're not reliable fully but no it's a snapshot and it it can be quite useful and just get you give you an an overall idea on the day they're not a full assessment yeah and I think for me I don't mind a screener but there needs to be and I said this in that thingy the other week a screen is a starting point it's not the finish point um so for me what really gets my goat and it gets a lot of people's goats as well is that there's nothing behind like Wiltshire local well, I, I know the Wiltshire team and they are wonderful but they can't with their resources do full assessments because they haven't got enough yeah. bodies they haven't got enough time space money bleh, they're not resourced enough and that's not because they aren't capable they are capable they just don't have capacity mm-hmm. and that's the story of the world over so you might get a screener but it doesn't tell you what to do about a particular child and yeah even- it's just ca- maybe catching a few pupils that you might not have noticed exactly that could be dyslexic exactly. but then it's what you do after exactly. that and even once you've got a screener you know once kids have if I write a full assessment and they're quite comprehensive mm. no they're, they're insanely comprehensive they have to be um yeah yeah because it are. matters it's incredibly important to get these things right and but then schools can't necessarily implement you know if a kid needs like a laptop or an ipad or summit what mm-hmm. schools can't do that necessarily and then there's the conflicts of well if parents can afford it can they bring it in if parents can't afford it what do you do then it, it's just so insufficiently resourced and that's that's just the, that's the real problem that I have that, that the screening bill is yeah. you're plastering over a crack that's like deeper mm-hmm. than the Grand Canyon it, not it's not enough I yeah. think for me yeah so you're in favor of the screener of, of screening children but you want more yeah then it needs to yeah. be backed up with a system that's fit for purpose no that makes sense so my next question was before I speak to Matt Hancock was if there's anything else that needs to be done to support dyslexic children in schools is screening well enough we've pretty much covered that so (laughs) in an answer no no (laughs) Um, I do I years ago and I've said it before I think I've said it to Sharon or in front of Sharon Hodgson he's just on on a bit isn't she um yeah years ago I went to Uruguay with um Mr Dr Ross after we got married and and I was researching around this um the the systematic review I did and it came up yeah. in Uruguay they have a thing called El Plan Ceval I don't know what Ceval means it, I, I, I think it's just a made up word but it's basically um because I do speak Spanish but that I hmm. and um, they have a program a national program as part mm-hmm. of their formal infrastructure where and it was I think it was 2009 every kid in a state school had a computer they had oh, a computer wow. was it was she Tesco who's value one it wasn't like your posh waitrose shiny one but yeah. every kid had a computer every school had wi-fi so that kids were equipped and they've expanded it and i've so i follow it and i'm, I'm i have a plan <laughs> i follow it and i kind of <laughs> look at the kind of things they do they've they're training older people they're helping parents get sort of tech savvy for supporting their kids and it's a national yeah. infrastructure program i think it's not i think the idea is a bit like is it barclays that bank that do the buddy thing and that kind of thing but it's it is a comprehensive national policy to get people literate and online computer wise Mm -hmm. so i think that's something that could be modeled the welsh new curriculum a guy called Mm -hmm. tom crick professor tom crick at swansea uni is kind of headed up the it and computer science bit and he's got this whole idea um around digital literacy so i think if you could kind of if england could nick a bit of the welsh curriculum and their ideas (laughs) because you know i met tom crick years ago at a conference he knows his stuff he's brilliant um yeah and if we could kind of look at the physical resourcing that uruguay has there's no reason apart from money and yeah money and money (laughs) yeah but even then (laughs) and and kind of priorities i think Mm -hmm. something like that could just liberate kids because they'd be free to just change the font size listen to stuff yeah I, have the spell check like yeah. yeah there's and there's so much software isn't there that can exactly. help dyslexic students that's a really good idea so yeah having having something like that having more tech in schools would be something you'd welcome as well yeah and if it's school managed yeah. tech it deals with a lot of the safeguarding yes so. absolutely well thank you ever so much you've been really brilliant guest and we'll go over to our next one 
Next, I am joined by Conservative MP Matt Hancock. Matt is the MP for West Suffolk. He was first elected in 2010. Within three years, Matt entered government and served in a number of ministerial roles under Prime Minister David Cameron, including Minister for Skills, Minister for Business and Paymaster General. Under Theresa May's premiership, Matt's role included being Minister for Digital and Culture, Minister for Digital and also Secretary of State in the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport. He was promoted to Secretary of State for Health and social care by Theresa May and held this position under Prime Minister Boris Johnson, managing the first 18 months of the coronavirus pandemic. Matt has been invited on this podcast because as an MP, he has been working to introduce universal screening for dyslexia in all UK primary schools, alongside better teacher training and support for those with neurodiverse conditions in schools, business and the criminal justice system. Hi, Matt. Thanks for coming Hi. on. Thank How you are you? For having me. I'm very good. Thank you. Good. So people who are listening may or may not be aware, but another reason we've invited you on is you're dyslexic yourself. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Although I was I was only identified, my dyslexia was only identified when I was uh, 18, when I got to university. So that's wow. one of the reasons that I want to you know, do this push for, for screening. Yeah, absolutely. So growing up with dyslexia, if you weren't you weren't aware you were dyslexic because you hadn't had the diagnosis until you were 18, but you must yeah. have been aware that you were obviously yeah. finding some things more difficult than other people. Um, oh, yeah. What did you find difficult? What was it like growing up? Well, I, I, I obviously knew that I thought differently. I knew there was yeah. something um, uh, different. Um, I, I'd make, you know, right from when I was small, I'd make mistakes and um, especially transposition of letters yeah, uh, and there's some really funny stories that my 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 parents remind you know remember and tell me like yeah. you know I'm dr- uh, we're driving uh, near my where I grew up in Chester uh, just outside Chester and there's a um, and I say what's Swan Wood? I say, <laughs> what do you mean? And I says look, it says Swan Wood for sale, but we've gone past the sign, and then the next day we go past the same sign and says look, Swan Wood for sale. What's Swan Wood? Like, no, Matt, it says Swan Wood. <laughs> um, I mean, that's just a sort of classic example. Um, yeah. And um, the, the, so I knew that there was something different. Yeah. Uh, and at school, my, re- you know, my response to this was just to concentrate on maths. You know, yeah. fortunately, I'm, I'm lucky that I'm good on the maths side of things. Mm-hmm. So, and in the, in the British education system, you can super specialise by A level. So yeah. at A level, I did maths, physics, economics and computing right I steered so, like, away from all the english <laughs> english literature on that side exactly anything that had longer than a sentence to write and i was in i was in trouble and yeah. then I, I got into oxford because in those days and they didn't require an exam you right. could do it through interview and yeah. you know i've always found that side of things uh, easy the talking bit yeah. Um, so, so I knew there was a problem. I just thought I was rubbish with words. I was rubbish at English and um, uh, and and history and or, you know all those subjects that require yeah. a lot of a lot of uh, writing. No, that makes sense. Do you do you wish you had been diagnosed sooner? Do you think yes. it would have made a difference? Like yes. if you were in primary school and you've been diagnosed then? Yeah, totally. For two reasons. Two two reasons. The first is the sort of practical reason, which is then I could have got the extra support that eventually I got because thankfully yeah. I was you know, I was at university. I was one of the best universities in the world. And so mm-hmm. they sent me for um essentially to relearn how to read and write. And wow. and, and, and that's so the sort of practical reason. But the second reason is for how I saw myself. You yeah. know, I, I, I love language and words now because I've got the confidence to grapple with them because I know that just because I can't read a word easily, especially words that are new to me, because mm-hmm. um, I essentially now recognise words as pictures and 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 um, so I, I struggle with new words but not with most words. And, um, and, and language more broadly and the beauty of language is something that I just kept myself away from. Yeah, um, sort of missed out. Yeah, I to- I, to- I think I missed out terribly. And because I'm a slow reader, I, I read as, you know, frankly, as little as I could get mm-hmm. away with. And because I didn't have the confidence to open a book. You know, I, yeah. I, I saw books with trepidation. And all of these things then fell away when I was told what the problem was. It, you know, it was a light bulb moment. It was, yeah. Um, somebody was just said, was it like... Um, or was it like, you know, when you get a crossword puzzle? And the answer to that is, well, that's not an experience I've really had. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, I imagine crossword puzzles aren't your favourite. <laughs> yeah, 
Exactly. Um, so working in the government then, what's, what, what was your experience with dyslexia working in the government? Presumably your role requires quite a lot of literacy-based tasks. And I yeah. imagine in the COVID pandemic in particular, there's a yeah. lot of you know really long medical terms that you must have had to say in front yeah. of a lot of people oh, at yeah. five o'clock on the evening when everyone's watching watching the yeah. briefings. So that must be yeah. tough. You're right. So it, I mean, there's a lot of words in government and there's a lot of paperwork and, and reading. But I had this... Um, In fact, my dyslexia forced me into a technique that I think made me more efficient as a minister, which was that I I asked private office to put a one page cover note on every note that I had, every decision I had to make. You know, typically as a secretary of state, you might have 20 papers between five and 20 pages long that need decisions. Um, And... Um, I was able to, I asked for a one-page note so that I could read the one-pager and decide whether I needed to do this or mm-hmm. if it wasn't, if it was neither controversial uh, nor something I had a particular personal interest in, then I'd delegate it to the relevant junior minister. And they yeah. could take, you know, they were, they were, um, they could take the decision and then I'd back their decision. I mean, that's, that's, um, uh, that's how it works. Um, and so... I, you know, I had these ways of working that yeah. helped me mitigate the fact I'm a slow reader, but actually ended up forcing me to concentrate on the decisions that, you know, only the Secretary of State can make, the big calls. Yeah. Um, so the, so that, that helped. But then the reading out, you know, I'm, I'm now good enough to, um, I'm, I'm quick enough at reading to be able to read a script. Um, although I'm far, far better when I haven't got a script, you know, when I'm just yeah. answering the question. Um and um, uh, and so that wasn't a problem again, so long as there were words I recognised. Yeah. And the, the you know, and and actually, do you know what? When I I I hadn't thought of this for ages. I've never said this before. But when Theresa May asked me to be health secretary, my first thought was, how on earth am I going to cope with all the long words? Yeah. Because medicine's full of. Uh, of long, complicated, mostly Latin or pre I was just going to say mostly Latin-based words yeah. as well that inherently and, and, are more difficult. Right, and and it, it it was it was actually fine because your job as health secretary is not to um, try to replicate what the clinicians do. Yeah. That's that's their job. Your job is to make the 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 big calls on the basis of what the what the population and the net, you know, the country and the NHS needs as a whole. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when I came across a new one, I'd have to learn it and, you know, really study it and go through um, phonetically. Um, uh, but it, it's not, you know, it's not just a matter of the phonics. It's a matter of really hammering the phonics in so that you recognize uh, a, a word and, and how it sounds. So, for instance, I'm terrible with, um, you know, if you say a new word to me, I won't be able to say it back to, me, to you. It's not just the reading. Oh, the Okay. Thing. There's a there's a there's a, an inability to process a new word very well until I really learn it and study it, um, and um, so it came. There were a, f- a couple of funny moments. One that the one of the funniest was when um, dexamethasone was discovered to be a a, a, a treatment. You know, yeah. it saved the lives of a third of people who ended up in hospital with COVID. So wow. this was big a big moment. It had been discovered. Uh, due to a clinical trial that had been organised by Oxford University, mm-hmm. uh, you know, so a massive. It was a global trial, but it was a massive UK, you know, success. The, yeah, yeah. the science behind this, and um, we were announcing it at five o'clock, and I spent half an hour with a JBT, the green <laughs> yeah. on our screens, um, saying, and he was sat there. He said, "Dexamethasone." <laughs> Dexa what? Yeah, um, it took, but it, but you know, it's a, it's quite a long word, and yeah. I, uh, I got it, I got it hammered in, and uh, got essentially it's about fluency, right? Yeah, and yeah. one of the things that we measure at the moment in primary schools, coming back to you know what the policy stuff, we measure phonics, and every pupil has a phonics test in year one, um, but we don't measure fluency, and you can be different, you know, you can be good at language and oral language but poor at um, your ability to get that down on paper. And that essentially is dysle- you know, the identification of dyslexia. Yeah. Um, and, um, uh, and so anyway, I got, I got fluent and now I can say dexamethasone as often as you like. Um, there was then, some proof right there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
Gosh, it's funny to think is that you don't imagine people who are, you know, are doing jobs like that, but in the background just before that, you know, just before the five o'clock briefing that you would be worried and struggling about a word. I think that might be quite, I don't know, reassuring for some people who are dyslexic to know that it's it's not just them. And there are, you know, lots of yeah. people struggling with issues like that that we'd have no idea of what is Well, we're around. only human as politicians. I know that isn't the impression that's <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we uh, uh, cut me and I will bleed. <laughs> So we, have you always been open about being dyslexic? So you were, you were open, presumably, at the briefings. Before the briefings, you were open to JVT, for example, about having dyslexia. Have you always been yeah. open no. in politics about your dyslexia? No, no. I spent 10, 20 years essentially hiding it. Um, wow. From being identified at Oxford and then, you know, my friends at Oxford and my tutors knew. And then, but then when I left, I didn't tell anybody. Wow. And I... Um, I, I thought that it would harm my career, right? To be honest, yeah. and um, and and also about that time, um, Microsoft invented spell check, yeah. you know that wiggly red line, and um, I, I, and so I, I I I don't know what I would have done without that in the mm -hmm. early stages of my uh, career when I was at the Bank of England, um, you know, um, writing notes. To the, you can't write a note to the governor of the Bank of England and make a spelling mistake. So no, you no. Know, um, I had uh, thankfully. Um, they'd invented spell check and it was all done on word processor obviously I don't know you know 10 years earlier that just wouldn't yeah. have been available to me. Do you, then, do you think people would have supported you if you'd have if you'd have said you were dyslexic straight out of university back then do you think it would have impacted on your job looking back? Oh great question I, I honestly don't know I don't think it would no. because uh, so as long as times had changed by then I don't know if they had because you know times are changing people are much yeah. more better about these things and they're much and, mo and people who aren't dyslexic are much more open to the challenges yeah. um, and what happened with me was that when I made it to the cabinet I explained to my new private secretary this um, process I had the one page notes yeah. and he said um, why and I said well I'll let you into a secret it's because I'm dyslexic and he said I'm dyslexic too you've no got way. to talk about this yeah yeah, yeah. So you've got to talk and because because you being in the cabinet and dyslexic will inspire you know, children who are dyslexic, that they can achieve great yeah. things um, and, you know, get to the top table. It, and uh, I, and I, I was pretty nervous about it. Mm -hmm. He organised a meeting of the internal private meeting of the civil service uh, neurodiversity group. And that is that was pretty big, a couple of hundred people. And I went and said, you know, I'm coming to make tell you something that nobody knows, which is that I'm dyslexic. And I got a huge, uh, incredibly warm, positive response Good. from that, doing it privately to 200 people. And then, and they, and then they said, "You've got to go and say this in public." And eventually, I decided to. And it was the response was incredibly warm, and it Good. you know, and, and, and it hasn't held me back. So, um, so, so my experience of it doing that in sort of what was that five years ago for four or five years ago, was very, very positive. I still don't know, it's impossible to know, isn't it, whether yeah. <laughs> 25 years ago rather than five years ago, the reaction would have been as positive. Yeah. Um, uh, or whether some people, you know, would have been more reactionary about it. Uh, yeah. who, who knows? You'll never know, no. So you're not alone in being dyslexic and leaving school without being identified as being dyslexic. Yeah. What percentage of children do you know are dyslexic? Um, at the moment in the UK and leaving school without a diagnosis? Do we know what the stats are on yes, that? Yes, it, it's estimated that it's 80% of dyslexic kids leave school without an identification. Well, that's shocking, isn't it, it? It's absolutely awful. And, you know, the, the, um, the thing about it is that I heard this statistic and I thought, well, that must be out of date. Mm -hmm. You know, that must have changed. So I asked the Department for Education yeah. and they confirmed that the, st the stats are exactly the same. No it's way. Just, 80%. 80%. And so I'm at, so that, you know, hence my drive for early identification, because it would have made such a difference to me. And I hear this story over and over again. And the worst argument against it I hear is people who aren't dyslexic saying, oh, but we mustn't label children. It's like, well, they ch the children label themselves. You know, I label yes. myself as rubbish at English um, and other um, modern languages, well, and ancient languages for that matter. I mean, I can't do any of them. Um, the... Um, <laughs> Uh, and people label themselves. Yeah, so yeah. you've both got the impact on self-esteem and you've got the uh, inability then to get the support that you need. 
Yeah. So do you want to, can you tell us a bit more about the dyslexia screening bill then? So we've touched yeah. on it a little bit. What your what is it? What are your hopes for it? Why we know why you're so passionate about it. Yeah. I think. <laughs> well, I've got this uh, you know, a, a personal um, reason for why it matters to me. Um, the bill will require the department uh, to ensure that in primary school all children are screened for dyslexia. And I've put screened not uh, formally diagnosed and yes. identified because you don't need to do the full formal uh, diagnosis test, which can be quite expensive and needs a, needs a person to do, um, a trained person. Uh, you don't need that for everybody, but you do need to find out who should be going for that diagnosis. Yeah. And these days, screening tools you know, can be a relatively rapid test. They're available for free online. Mm-hmm. Um, they are not perfect. You, know, you do get some false negatives and false positives. Um, but they're not meant to be perfect. They're data to improve the teaching of children and to get identification for those uh, who need it. And, yeah. um, and and so this can be done. Essentially, what I'm asking schools is for, uh, you know, an hour of time for every child at some point during primary school. I mean, yeah. you know, the best schools that I've seen do this in year one. And then for, mm-hmm. the, the, for the children who are behind, they keep repeating it until hopefully those children have had the extra support and caught up. Uh, some of them will, some of them won't be able to, but you keep, uh, you know, you keep checking and testing. So okay. the best methodology is early, do this early and then keep repeating. Uh, and, then, and then also, you know, it might have been an education gap. It might be a problem of uh, poor teaching very early on. So the formal identification is probably best done later, but the early screening right at the start of primary school um, and then keep testing those who are who are um, uh, who, who need who, who, who need the extra support. Now, I'm not putting all those details in the bill. The bill is just to require screening at some yeah. point during primary school and then also to require the department to um, uh, for to strengthen the teacher training for all neurodiverse conditions, because after all, yeah. all teachers are teachers of dyslexic kids and, and and kids with all neurodiverse conditions. Yes, brilliant. So it takes quite a lot of work for a bill to become law, doesn't it? So can you briefly explain? It's a yeah. lengthy. Yeah, that's so, right. Let's not spend problem. an hour chatting about it. But yeah. um, what's the brief? You know, from going from a green paper to like the Queen giving it royal assent. Yeah, royal assent. So becoming law. Exactly. What's, the, what's the process? So the process is that um, in, in both the common House of Commons and the House of Lords, you have to have three readings, yep. as they're called. And in between that, you have what's called a committee stage, where a, a, a smaller group of people go through each line of the bill. Yep. So I've done the first reading and secured a slot for the second reading, which first reading is basically publication. Yep. Second reading will be on the 16th of September. That's when we have the actual debate about the principles of the bill. Do we need this? Now, I think that'll be pretty positive because yeah. you know, this has got cross-party support. Um, and I'm working with the department to get government support for that as well. Because uh, mm-hmm. if you get a consensus in the House of Commons and no vote, um, then it is much easier, especially for these bills that come from the back benches rather than from government. Um, then it will go into committee during the autumn and there'll be a um, probably, I don't know, uh, six weeks of, you know, a series of committee meetings to scrutinise each line of the bill. Yeah. Um, and then it goes back for that reports to the House of Commons as a whole and goes back to it goes for third reading, which I'd hope by the sort of mm, hopefully November, December. Then the whole rigmarole um, goes through again in the House of Lords and the deadline is... You've got to get it done before the, what's called the prorogation, which is when Parliament stops sitting ahead of the next Queen's speech. Now, a Queen's speech yeah. might be next May, or it might be, um, there might not be another one before the next election, which is due May 2024, most likely. So um, if there's two years, then we'll definitely have time to get this through. If there's one year, we should have time to get it through, as long as nobody in the House of Lords holds it up and sort of tries to talk it out and yeah. uh, and all of that. So that's the process. It's a long uh, process, absolutely. It's just changing the law, so, yeah. you know. But, um, yeah, it's got to be. That yeah. makes sense. Um, and, it, you know, it basically, the whole process is easier if the government uh, gets on board, and I'm talking yeah. to Nadim Zahawi and, and, and his team, and, and 
Will Quince, who's uh, very supportive as the junior minister, to make sure that we get the details right so that they, they're they happy with it. Yeah, so teachers listening to this and head teachers who'll be thinking, OK, this is great. But realistically, when do you think they could be expecting to be able to do these screenings within their classes to their you know, that's, a, that, that's an excellent question that is exactly the sort of question we get in, in the committee stage. Um, yeah. uh, 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 and actually, I've got a I've got a judgment to make as to whether to put a date on it. Yeah, you know that this should start in the academic year. I mean, realistically, it's this isn't going to be through until um, April twenty twenty three at the earliest. So, um, starting with academic year twenty three twenty four is possible. That might be a push. Yeah, um, I don't think it's that difficult because this stuff. You know, these, these screeners are available online and it's one and, year in the whole yeah. primary school. And like you um, say, if it's free software as well that they can do online, then... Yeah, I mean, there's, there's also paid-for software. I don't yeah, mind yeah. How, <laughs> how, how they do it, as long as it's up to a decent standard. Um, so, you know, whether it's 23, 24 or 24, 25, yeah. I'm kind of... I'm kind of I, I obviously want it to be the sooner, but... Um, yeah, you can't but promise I, I'd anything. I'd rather bring people, you know, with me and not have people essentially taking against the whole thing because they're complaining about the date of introduction. Yeah, that makes sense. So we must stress as well that dyslexia screening, like you said, isn't the same as a diagnosis. If the bill is successful, what support are you envisaging yeah. for those children who are identified through the screening process? So is there going to be more funding, for example, if, right. if you catch loads of children? You know, if I, I was a teacher, if I was teaching and I did the screener yeah. and I catch, I don't know, five kids in my class and I think, gosh, they, I think they could be dyslexic. Am I then going to have the funding to be able to get them diagnosed? Well, the... There is some funding that exists. Yeah. Uh, obviously, l- lots of people worry that it isn't enough. And mm. I hear the stories, which are different in different parts of the country, about yeah. the lengths of delays. And not only for dyslexia, actually, the lengths of delays for other diagnoses yeah, by yeah, ADHD are even longer. I mean, and it's terrible. Um, however, I'm not pushing on the funding at this point because mm-hmm. I want to get this done and through. And I know from being in government that you don't manage what you can't measure and at the moment this isn't measured properly you know the children aren't identified so let's get the identification first and then the funding to follow that of course there there are funding packages available for those who get the identification uh, but the bottleneck is at the funding for the yeah. uh, the formal diagnosis stage now as it happens i think that can be done more cheaply you know it okay. currently costs four or five hundred pounds uh, per pupil to get that diagnosis um, I think that's a bit steep, to be honest, um, and I hope that we can reduce that cost as well. But I'm not putting that in this bill, because if I ask for funding in the bill, then there'd be a whole other series of complications. Yeah, um, and it could delay it and take it, longer, presumably. Exactly, so one step at a time. Yeah, is there, is there a danger of some children who whose parents might be able to afford for private diagnosis then doing yes. that and having yeah, like a almost like a, a split here in a sense? Look, there's there, a she... massive injustice here, yeah. which is that if you're one of the 7% of children who goes to private school, you're much more likely to get a diagnosis. Mm. And if you're, if you're in state school and your parents can afford to pay, you're much more likely. Yeah. And in fact, if you look at the, um, at the demographics of who gets a diagnosis, there's a U-shape, okay? Mm-hmm. So the children who get, who have... Um, uh, the um, pupil premium are more likely to get a diagnosis, partly because there is funding, of, extra funding available to support their education. The, and then the kids at the top of the demographic profile, whose parents are uh, relatively well paid, um, they are much more likely to get a, 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 um, a diagnosis. And then it, 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 you know, there, is a, there is a social injustice here that yeah, basically definitely. if you, if you're, the, you know, education should be universal. And the mm. point of universal education is to make sure every child can thrive irrespective of how well their parents have done in life. Um, we know that there are barriers to that, but this is one that we absolutely can sort out. So, that it, you know, it, there should not be a relationship between your parents' income and your likelihood of getting a diagnosis for dyslexia. Yeah. It's, it's an outrage that there is, and I hope this bill will put that right. Brilliant. Well, thanks ever so much. Really appreciate it. Well, it's been great to be on. I really care about this subject and I'm so glad that you're doing so much work to promote it. Thank you.
Next up is Sharon Hodgson, who is MP, Member of Parliament for Washington and Sunderland West, and has served as a Labour MP since 2005. Sharon has taken on many roles in Parliament since her election in 2005, including being Parliamentary Private Secretary to Government Ministers. She has been on key parliamentary committees, such as the Children's, Schools and Families Select Committee. She has been a Government Whip, and she has had shadow ministerial roles. In April 2021, Sharon was appointed to be Parliamentary Private Secretary to Leader of the Labour Party, Sir Keir Starmer MP. Sharon is also active in a number of other areas and currently chairs various all-party parliamentary groups, which are APPGs, one of which I'm going to be asking her about shortly as it's very relevant to this podcast episode. So lovely to meet you, Sharon. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat to me. Oh, lovely to meet you too, Georgina, and um, thank you for asking me. Um, As well as being MP for Washington and Sunderland West and Parliamentary Private Secretary to Keir Starmer MP, who's the leader of the Labour Party, you are chair of the APPG for Specific Learning Difficulties and Dyslexia, I believe. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Brilliant. Can you explain what an APPG is? Because I'm not going to presume everyone knows. Um, And what your role on this specific one is? So um, on this specific one, I'm the chair. Um, I didn't set this one up. It, it's already been running for um, a number of years. I used mm-hmm. to be a, um, a vice chair of it. And yeah. an o- APBG stands for All Party Parliamentary Group. And so they are, it does what it says on the tin, I suppose, really, sort of all party. So a cross party, all the different parties in the House can be involved. Um, uh, parliamentary, uh, we are parliamentarians, so MPs and peers, um, but we also have invited guests, all the stakeholders are invited to come along and um, share in the discussions. We invite them along and they can be regular attenders at our meetings. But the purpose is to sort of um, have a special interest group, if you like, yeah. of like-minded people who come together to lobby and campaign and find out more about a particular subject. And I do a lot of all-party group work. When we were in government, I did, and now in opposition, I feel mm-hmm. it is especially important because you can work cross-party with members who may be in the government act better access to government ministers than I do and um, you know you can therefore um, you know find the ear of the person who actually has the power to do something about whatever the issue is you're campaigning on where I can stand in the chamber and shout all I like and you know (laughs) about a particular issue and nobody's going to listen but if we all come together and work and put all our best heads together across both houses it's amazing what you can achieve really. Fantastic. And you said about sort of you choose an interest area. So where does your passion from dyslexia stem from? Am I right in thinking you, you've got a child who's dyslexic? Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So my son, Joseph, who's now 28 and in the REF training to be an air traffic controller, oh, was that, um, you know, very different story years ago. He couldn't read to any level that could be measured till he was about 14. Wow. Um, he was the, the, the happy child in class who... Um, um, he had delayed speech, didn't speak at all till he was three, but was always happy and cheerful and bright. I knew he was bright, but yeah. um, when other kids started learning to be able to speak and read, he couldn't. Mm-hmm. The speech, um, he did start getting speech and language therapy, but still nobody identified the dyslexia. Mm. I was constantly told, do you read with them at home? Do you, oh, do, 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 you, I know, do, you, do you have much conversation at home? Because, you know, the delayed speech. Yeah. It, it was constantly felt as a parent of a child who then turned out to be severely dyslexic that all of this was my fault. The delayed oh, speech my was my fault. The dyslexia, which I didn't know what it was then, yeah. um, that was all my fault. And then teachers. So there was such a long... And my daughter's a teacher now. She's a maths teacher, so I am not distant teacher. <laughs> but all of these teachers from nursery, reception, year one, two, all the way through, until he got to his year five teacher, not one of them had said, maybe Joseph's dyslexic. Oh, my goodness. The year five teacher was the one who eventually said that very phrase. I think Joseph may be dyslexic. Yeah. I, did, I was aware of dyslexia. I didn't know much about it. I wasn't an MP at that time. I was, um, you know, I think I worked for the party at that time. Um, I hadn't done all the, you know, what I wish if I'd known then what I know now, yeah. things would be very different, but I didn't. So um, I then looked it up. I went home and looked it up. Um, 
I think we had the internet back then. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is a, it is a while just ago because he was he was he was nine, so it's like nineteen years ago. But I just yeah, about I think that. yeah, I didn't have we didn't have the smartphones. But I, I went on the computer and I looked it up, and it was. If you can answer yes to these 10 things, your child may be dyslexic. And not only could I answer yes to all of them, um, it was like someone was describing Joseph. Oh, wow. Absolutely him. So I went in the next day and I, I said, I've been reading up on dyslexia. What do we do now? And then that's when we started the process of ha having him statemented, which took yeah. all year. She moved classes with him. That teacher, she moved into year six. And it might have been other reasons as well, but I think yeah. she definitely wanted to make sure Joseph got through and got his statement. So I thought that was going to be the magic carpet. He had a statement yeah. now. He would get the right support. He had all these hours with a teaching assistant. But then I realised eventually when he went to high school and then got older and older, the reading wasn't coming because all these hours with a teaching assistant couldn't help him any more than I could when I used to mm -hmm. sit at home torturing him. Oh, otherwise known as reading with him um, <laughs> on, a, on an evening. Yeah. So what did help him eventually, because by then I knew more about it. I was an MP, I joined the Dyslexia All Party Group, met people from Dyslexia Action, and then I sent him to the Newcastle Office of Dyslexia Action, had to pay £400 for the, mm -hmm. the assessment, even though we already had a statement, had to then pay, I think it was £60 a week for an hour and a half. But within one year, because he was doing his GCSEs, he was 14, doing his GCSEs and couldn't yeah. read. Yeah. And, and all the teachers by then were acknowledging he was bright, but you know he couldn't read, so he couldn't access the curriculum, mm -hmm. which is through a, a, the method of reading and writing. Yeah. So one year with a specialist for an hour and a half a week and he, he, he had a reading age of 14. Wow. So that made me even more passionate that what we've got to do is ensure that all children are assessed and mm -hmm. then given the proper support, not just with a well-meaning teaching assistant, but with a specialist. Yes. He needed one and a half hours with a specialist, not 15 hours with a teaching assistant. And also every teacher is a teacher of a child with special educational needs. So all teachers should get um, training in how to identify and support children with SEN or SEN. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's been my passion ever since. So that sorry for the long answer. No, to it was. I was question. really. I was enjoying listening to what. Yeah, your experience of it. I just can't. It must have been really difficult when, as a parent, when you worry about things anyway with your children when they're at school. But to to have them blaming you and saying, "Are you reading enough to them?" That must have been heartbreaking. Yeah. It was. Yeah. It was awful. But that showed to me the lack of knowledge that the all these teachers had about yeah. what was wrong with joseph about dyslexia and when you consider at least three in every 10 children in a class will have some sen and one in 10 could have dyslexia they're, they're going to have three six nine at least nine kids with an sen yeah. and probably three with dyslexia it's just the te we're not equipping our teachers with the tools they need um to to you know to help all children with special educational needs and disabilities. Yeah, no, I completely agree. So I've just spoken with Matt Hancock about the dyslexia screening bill and why he's so passionate about that. Can I ask what your what your thoughts on the dyslexia screening bill are? Um, well, the all party group were massively behind it. We totally support um, the aims and what he's trying to achieve with um, you know the assessment and screening um, yeah. for children. It should be a first step in life. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, all children, if the teacher, maybe not every single child, but depending on how accessible the screening tools are, it could be every single child, yeah. but it should at least be the children who look like they may be struggling yes. to find out, because not every child who's struggling with reading will um, turn out to be dyslexic, mm -hmm. but every um, dyslexic child will be struggling to read. Yeah. So, you know, it absolutely should um, be something that um, happens at the moment, unless you've got a teacher like Joseph had in year five, it will only be the per the children of parents who can afford to go private to get that assessment and to get that support that will yeah. get, um, you know, the chance to fulfil their potential. How many children are going through school that never really um, ever get identified, never get the support they need and therefore don't get the exams they need to go on to achieve what they may achieve. Children who are neurodiverse and with dyslexia are usually 
very highly intelligent. It just seems to be not all. You'll no. get some highly intelligent dyslexics and some moderately intelligent dyslexics and maybe, um, you know, just average dyslexics. Yeah. But, you know, there'll be the full spectrum of intelligence as indeed um, neurodiversity and dyslexia is on a spectrum. So, um Matt Hancock is a brilliant example of that. He, you know, you can't really say he's an underachiever because <laughs> before he was diagnosed, he was able to get himself through school with enough yeah. qualifications to get into Oxford, no less, on PPE, yeah. um, you know, uh, f- philosophy, politics and economics. So yeah. made it all the way there. And then eventually a professor at Oxford was the one who said, I think you may be dyslexic. Now, yeah. um, Matt obviously wasn't held back he ended up in the cabinet but I'm sure he struggled and I'm sure his self-esteem at times could have done with knowing what it was that made him have to say work 10 times harder than his peers to achieve what they were achieving easily I'm sure and that's why he's so passionate about pushing for this now because he'll know that he can't really sort of do you know the the violin and say poor me because he's achieved yeah. great things but he'll know internally what that meant having to do that and what he went through and how he felt about um his you know his struggles because joseph for instance when he was asked at age 10 on a scale of by his educational psychologist my son on a scale of one to ten where one is not very clever mm-hmm. and two is, is in ten is super clever super intelligent where are you he said he was a two Oh, good. So at age ten, this 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 to have that boy, view of himself then uh, thought yeah. he was really, you know, not very clever, like a bit stupid, not as clever as his peers. And you know, look at him now in the RAF, you know, going to be an air traffic controller. And so, if that he wouldn't be where he is now if he hadn't have been assessed and I hadn't have managed no. to then get him the support. So every day, because I, I know I had to pay for that support, even though he was statemented. So yeah. even though you statemented, it still didn't work. And that, that has stayed with me every day because it shouldn't be according to your parents' means, whether no. you get the support you need. Yeah, we need to catch them all, don't we? We need to be able to identify anybody who's dyslexic in schools. No, I agree. Um, so as well as screening for dyslexia in schools, what more do you think needs to be done? We touched a little bit on about teacher training. I know when when I did my teacher training, um. I didn't. I don't think they taught me anything about dyslexia when I was doing like my PGCE. I don't. Um, it wasn't until later in my career when I said that I was interested in special educational needs that then I got training off my own back. If you see what I mean, and the school supported it. But do you think this is still the case? Are we finding that teachers are going into starting their careers with little knowledge about SEND? Do you think we need to be doing a lot more that way? And is there anything else we need to be doing apart from just screening for dyslexia? Because screening isn't a diagnosis either, is it? It's it's just no. identifying those children who could potentially be dyslexic. Absolutely. Um, yeah, initial teacher training, the, uh, Emily, my daughter, who went through her t- 26, so she was 21, 22, yeah. when she was doing her PJCE and having grown up, um, living in this household with this, you know, issue um, with her brother and yeah. the campaigning issue. I mean, not him and his dyslexia, but sort of this campaign yeah. around the lack of knowledge of dyslexia and um, teachers' knowledge around dyslexia. When she was becoming a teacher during her training, she was very aware and was on the lookout for SEND training. Yeah. And she would feed back to me how little there was Mm -hmm. and how she had to seek it out and look for it and did a volunteer for it, which I knew was the case anyway. But I hope that after 10 years of campaigning by me and other parliamentarians, that maybe it was getting a bit better. So to hear it was still something she had to look for and volunteer for and got very little. Um, that other teachers who weren't, you know, on this quest and looking for it wouldn't wouldn't no, begin. It just filled me with horror because myself and Lord Addington, who's um, my co-chair on the yeah. All Party Group, well, he's vice chair on there, and then he we we sort of do it together because he's chair of president rather of British Dyslexia Association, yes. and I'm the vice president of British Dyslexia Association. So we sort of have uh, swap positions depending <laughs> on which hat we're wearing. So, but we're you know um, the main we have been the mainstays for dyslexia campaigning in Parliament for like ten years. Um, happily joined by Matt Hancock now and uh, Tom Hunt, who's a new yeah. um, 
Conservative MP, I think I've got that name, Tom Hunt. Tom Hunt yes. yes. Yeah. Um, uh, he's joined our group as well, and he's dyslexic himself, and he is um, absolutely on board with us now. So uh, it's great to have um, have him. Something's just popped in actually from Tom Hunt, interestingly. Into How strange. His, his, his <laughs> name, I said his name, and he popped up on the corner. He's just sent me an email. Isn't that uh, amazing? <laughs> I love it when spooky things like that happen. Serendipity. He must have just been thinking, oh, I'll just send Sharon an email because she's talking about me. (laughs) So, um, so yes, definitely broader teacher training, mandatory initial teacher training, then also CPD. There's got to be CPD for all teachers because all teachers are teachers of children with special educational needs and disabilities. I want them to have that, you know, knowledge. Then I want more specialist teachers who have a wider Mm -hmm. knowledge base. You know, we should be training. The Rose Review under Ed Balls, he was the first one in back in the day when we were in government that I was lobbying and he did the Rose Review which recommended 4,000 specialist dyslexia teachers. Yeah. Lots of government money was put into that. All of these teachers were trained but then they never found the jobs or the you know the, the level of um, job within schools. So a lot of them went to the private sector or went to other countries or went to um, you know independent schools and stuff. So oh you know what's become of all those 4,000 um, tr- specialist yeah. dyslexia teachers because we could do with them now um, and also um, better SENCO qualifications um, which properly um, encompass specific learning difficulties as well not just you know because lots of people know things maybe about autism and um, uh, you know wider SEND but on yeah. this specific learning difficulties such as dyscalculia and dyspraxia and there's very little known about um, those uh, issues. Yeah. The other thing that I think we should do um, and we did talk about it at the all party group and we're, we've made it one of our missions for, for this year's work over the next year of the all party group is the um, the lack of assessment among the prison population yeah. um, for special educational needs, literacy, speech and language difficulties. And I know uh, Lord Ramsbottom years ago, who used to be a former chief inspector of prisons, um, mm-hmm. he was the chair of the all party group for speech and language difficulty. And he did a lot of work in this area and said the numbers who had speech and language difficulties in prison from the work he'd done, he reckons was up near 80%. Wow. And that um, then when we looked into to it around the prison population for dyslexia um, and maybe other specific learning difficulties as well it could be it was up to around 60 percent so we want to do some new research around these numbers because you can see what happens that's not a coincidence like I often think children like Joseph I was desperate for him to get the label of what was wrong with them. Yeah. You know, they would say, oh, the, te- is the teachers, when I'd be saying, has he got a special educational yeah. need? They would go, oh, you're obsessing about giving him a label. He just <laughs> needs to be, you know, more time spent reading with him at home and more time, you know, he'll catch up. He's just, um, you know, a bit delayed. Um, some children learn at different rates. No. He was dyslexic and he yeah. needed that label. And as a mum, you know these things, don't you? You know your children. I think yeah. that, yeah, parents are the expert of their own children because, that they need to listen to. Absolutely. And that label, I wanted it because what he was starting to get as he got older was a little bit more frustrated yeah. and angry. And that came out, even though eventually he got the label when he was 10 and got the statement and all that. Once he got to secondary school and the testosterone and teenagers, he would. And that's one of the reasons why at 14, I knew I had to seek private help for him because he was starting to get angry and frustrated. Now, if he hadn't wasn't getting that support and hadn't been identified, would he have started becoming the angry, destructive, yeah. naughty child yeah. that then ends up in the criminal justice system and is the adult in that prison? Yeah. You can see how lack of screening and lack of support at a young age to ensure kids get the opportunity that you know education is for, that if they don't, because they've got an underlying SEND, you can see how that could lead to them being ended up in prison. Absolutely. I've taught, I used to teach secondary and when you're talking, I can think of so many children I've taught who's, you know, they started in year seven and 
the behavior declined because just through sheer frustration that they it was a choice really they could either sit there and attempt the work knowing they couldn't read it and they couldn't write the answers probably due to undiagnosed dyslexia or a special educational need or or they could misbehave because it was cooler to misbehave and they were, you know, they were frustrated and it was very challenging for them to be in that classroom. And you can, like you say, you can see, it's like, we can see how it could progress and the dangers of, of, of not catching them early and being able to give them that support. And it's just that feeling of, I suppose, like disillusion, isn't it? And like disengagement because they're just yeah. not achieving. Yeah, and it's that's heartbreaking. heartbreaking, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Jinx. It is heartbreaking. Yeah, <laughs> Absolutely yeah. heartbreaking, it is. I, I think we've covered everything there. So thank you ever so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure to welcome you. Oh, Taz, yeah. Well, that concludes our special episode on the Dyslexia Screening Bill. I should also add that since recording the podcast, there's been lots of changes in government. The issues raised and the comments made by my guest remain relevant, though, and this shouldn't affect the timescales of the Dyslexia Screening Bill readings. Do continue the conversation on social media using the hashtag SendingTheExperts. And thanks again for listening to Sending the Experts with me, Georgina Durrant. <laughs>